So thanks to all of our listeners for joining us today for the new terms first episode of the Gray Matters Pulse of the Court podcast series. And in this podcast, we like to talk about issues before the court that are timely um, and kind of take a peek of what it might be like to look inside the justice's consideration of cases, maybe look inside the courtroom. Today, I am thrilled to start off the series here at the beginning of OT Term 22, October Term 22, with Professor Steve Vladek, who holds the Charles Allen Wright Chair in Federal Courts at the University of Texas School of Law. He's a nationally recognized expert on Fed courts, con law, national security law, military justice. He's argued more than a dozen cases before the U.S. Supreme Court, Texas Supreme Court, various lower federal civilian and military courts. And he and I just so, it just so happens we may or may not have testified in Congress together uh, previously at the same time, possibly on different sides of various issues. But he is a well-known national scholar, has a book coming out, um, in the not too distant future that I'd like to ask him about later. And Steve, we're, Professor Wadick, we're just super thrilled to have you joining us for this first episode of the term. Thank you for having me. Um, and I'm, I'm fine with first names, Jen, if you are. <laughs> that sounds good to me. So today we're gonna be a little bit less conventional because at this time of the fall, one week, or I guess it's about 10 days before the court has its first arguments uh, on October 3rd, long conference to consider petitions from the summer on September 28th, many organizations are holding events and discussions about previewing the Supreme Court term in general. I'm excited to be able to do one of those for Senate staff next week. But Steve and I today are gonna take a snapshot of some petitions actually that are pending before the court. So cases that the court has not yet decided to hear that Steve and I hope the case, the court will perhaps consider. And the, there are a couple of common commonalities between the two petitions that we're going to discuss today. They are both cases coming up through the Second Circuit involving criminal law. And importantly for our purposes here at the Gray Center, they involve important issues of separation of power. So structural constitutional issues or protections that get to some of the issues that the justices really uh, in recent years seem uh, very predisposed to want to consider. So um, I'll talk about the first case, which is um, a case coming up originally from the Eastern District of New York involving the Federal Rule of Criminal Procedure 33, right to a new uh, trial, which at first, you know, you, the separation of powers connection doesn't necessarily jump out at you, but we'll talk a little bit about that. The second case uh, involves an issue that's one of my first loves, the appointments clause that Steve Vladek is also now studying, um, that it had a split decision in the Second Circuit. And I think, Steve, it's fair to say that there are many things in the law on which you and I might happen to disagree. Maybe... Steve thinks there's a shadow docket. I think it's an emergency orders docket. Steve thinks the court's been granting cases on the docket more frequently recently. I think it's business as usual. Steve's writing a book on it. But on one issue we do agree, which is that in US versus Donziger, the second circuit case that Steve is going to discuss, um, it would be really wonderful if the court decided to take a look at an important appointments clause question about federal supervision over the role of special prosecutors. So I feel like on a day when Steve Vladek and Jen Mascot are agreeing, it's a great day to have an interesting discussion and figure out what issue might be um, might be drawing us together because we are frequently um, in events where we're holding cordial, very collegial and wonderful um, discussions, but uh, often on opposite sides. So um, with that, I think I'll just jump into a brief summary of the first petition. Uh, well, and both of these cases also are important because the, the, um, the Scalia Law School Separation of Powers Clinic um, filed amicus briefs in support of both of these position or petitions involving criminal law up from the Second Circuit. So we've gotten students excited and interested in the issues. Well, actually, we haven't filed yet. So we, we are planning, we're working with uh, Steve Vladek to file. Um, I was going to say, if, if you filed already, I missed a memo. <laughs> I'm a 
little bit ahead of myself. So we filed a petition in the Nordblik case that I'll discuss here in a second. And we're we're going to be partnering with Steve Vladek, who's also working with a Cher Jaffe law firm in representing um, Donziger to, 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 to look at um, supporting their petition as well. And, you know, a lot of cases before the court do at the end of the day have a lot of amicus support, but it's actually um, much less typical to have amicus support at the uh, petition for cert stage. So I think that suggests in and of itself, the fact that you're gathering amicus support, the fact that there's amicus support in, this Nor in the Norlick matter, that these are important issues. They're contentious issues. There is there issues that it would really merit uh, the justice, we, we think would merit the justice's attention um, to take a look at. So in the Nordlich case, um, it involves the federal rule of uh, criminal procedure 33, which basically um, says that uh, a judge may vacate and grant a new trial if the interest of justice so requires. And so this is, a, this is an interesting rule to think about because obviously in the criminal context, um, we all know that the right to jury trial is very important. The jury issues the verdict in the case, guilty or innocent. And so the jury trial is, is a way in which there's democratic participation in our legal system and is really important. And so sometimes the new trial right at the federal level might be thought of or the or might be thought of as, as intention with the jury trial right. But what the uh, separation of powers clinic and I discovered going back and researching this issue for um, the amicus brief on this petition is that actually there's a lot of evidence even going back to extensive discussion of the new trial right by Blackstone under British practice that it was actually seen as an important mechanism to protect the jury trial right because if a judge or the defendant believes that the jury has significantly erred in issuing the verdict and that the verdict is against the weight of the evidence, um, there are two potential ways to um, challenge or review the verdict. One is for there to be a motion for acquittal, and that's a much higher standard in theory under current practice, Federal Rule of Criminal Procedure 29, um, that um, if the evidence is insufficient to support a conviction, the judge must grant acquittal. The new trial right doesn't actually grant acquittal. It essentially, what it does is give the right to a second jury trial. So even just as a procedural matter, it actually supports jury trial rights because it sends the case back for another jury. And the judge, um, at least under the text of federal, rule criminal, uh, federal criminal rule 33, seems to have significantly more discretion, may vacate and grant a new trial if interest of justice so requires. Of course, the rule itself doesn't define that term. So in this particular case, um, this criminal defendant was actually granted a new trial at the district court level, and the Second Circuit reversed that determination. So that in and of itself is um, intriguing because often, you know, we might see the appellate court being willing to defer more to the determination of a district judge who would have been there, seen the evidence firsthand, seen the, the uh, case presented. But in this case, the Second Circuit reversed. And as it turns out, um, there seems to be a fairly deep circuit split on this question. The Supreme Court has never actually squarely stepped in and determined and opined on precisely what the evidentiary standard is for a district judge to grant a new trial in the interest of justice. And the Second Circuit, along with the 11th Circuit, seem to have a very strict standard. They almost seem to suggest that unless the evidence is patently incredible or defies physical realities, that they will not defer to a district judge's determination to grant a new trial. In contrast, the 5th Circuit, 7th, 8th, and 9th Circuits are much more willing to go with a, a judge's discretion if there are and, and to, to allow him to um, reweigh the evidence, if there are credibility considerations, if, uh, ev if, if inferences have perhaps been drawn incorrectly, just to re-examine to re whether the jury has actually been correct that the evidence um, supports conviction beyond a reasonable doubt. And then there's been some confusion and inconsistency in the third, sixth, and tenth circuits. So many circuits have weighed in, the Supreme Court hasn't yet. And what the clinic found when the students did a lot of research, um, and I filed it actually the brief in my um, academic capacity, so did a fair amount of research as well, um, is that starting from the time of Blackstone, there was an understanding that the new trial right was going to be provided if the verdict was against the weight of the evidence. 
So seemingly a significantly less, significantly less stringent standard perhaps in the Second Circuit's imposed in this case, a standard that imports a lot of discretion and perhaps an issue that the current justices will be interested in because we also found that Justice Barrett's scholarship prior to her time on the court touched a, a little bit on the new trial standard in passing and um, our system of government granted a new trial right as early as the the Judiciary Act of 1789. And so when one looks at federal cases, state court cases, starting from late 18th, near early 19th century, all the way up through um, the incorporation of the modern federal rules, there really is a sense that this um, verdict against the weight of the evidence standard was in play and that the new trial right was seen as an important check on the jury verdict, not again because we're undermining the jury, but because if the judge and the jury together um, reach, re reach a consistent determination or there's a second jury put into place to safeguard and make sure the jury determination is correct, that really this important right, this important feature of our system for uh, criminal defendants can be enhanced and it's an important check against federal prosecutorial overreach. So on that note, so the, 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 the I and the clinic hope that the court will grant cert and look at the federal rule of criminal procedure um, standard in rule 33. On the issue of prosecutorial overreach, that I think is also a common theme in Professor Steve Vladek's petition that was just filed this week dealing with Donziger because we're looking there at whether prosecutors who are handling that case were actually selected in compliance with an important constitutional safeguard known as the Employments Clause, which I've written a fair amount about in other contexts. And now I'd love to hear uh, Steve Vladek's take on his petition and what he thinks the Second Circuit has gotten wrong and what the court needs to look at when it uh, takes a look at the briefing in his case. Sure. Thanks, Jen. Um, so, you know, Steve Donziger is a uh, former lawyer um, who was uh, heavily involved in trying to hold Chevron accountable for claims of environmental degradation in Ecuador. Um, folks have strong opinions about the underlying facts of that case. Fortunately, that's not the center of this particular appeal. Um, Donziger was eventually held in contempt by a federal district judge in New York. Um, who issued an order to show cause why he shouldn't be charged with six counts of criminal contempt of court. Um, that order was referred to federal prosecutors, the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District. The U.S. Attorney declined and said, basically, we don't have the time or wherewithal uh, to bring this case. Um, at that point, the district judge, Judge Kaplan, invoked a, I think, not very well-known provision of Rule 42 of the Federal Rules of Criminal Procedure, that authorizes the appointment of a private special prosecutor to try criminal contempt of court offenses that the US attorney or the quote attorney for the government um, has declined to try. Um, and that rule was updated in 2002 in response to this 1987 Supreme Court decision called Young versus United States ex rel Vuitton et Fille. Um, basically Young, had upheld the sort of rare but not unheard of practice of courts appointing special prosecutors in those cases. But Jen, what's so interesting is Young's, the Justice Brennan's majority opinion in Young viewed the entire thing, the judicial appointment of a private special prosecutor as an exercise of judicial power um, and viewed the private special prosecutors themselves as exercising judicial power. And so therefore, there was no reason to worry about the appointments clause because these were just employees of the judicial branch wielding judicial power in these weird criminal contempt prosecutions. Um, I, I think some of that is probably a remnant of a time before which the Supreme Court had clarified that criminal contempt is an ordinary crime. Uh, right, the, the Supreme Court doesn't actually hold that criminal contempt is a typical regular criminal offense till 1968. And the practice of appointing prosecutors predates that. It actually goes back to Judge Learned Hand in 1935. Mm -hmm. um, but whatever, I mean, right, that there's this, there's this 1987 Brennan opinion that says this is all an exercise of judicial power. Um, there's a very long, angsty concurrence in the judgment in Young by a brand new justice named Antonin Scalia. Um, who said, I don't understand how this can be judicial power. This sure looks like executive power to me. Um, and of course, if it's executive power, then that raises serious questions about the appointments clause, because how can a rule of civil procedure 
authorize an appointment consistent with the appointments clause. Uh, but he concurs in the judgment anyway, because the court had thrown out the appointments on other grounds. So that was young. And that was the last time the Supreme Court has said anything, or at least anything material, right, about why this is kosher. Um, in the 35 years since, Jen, as you know, as well as anyone, um, the court's appointments clause jurisprudence has taken something of a formalist turn. Um, the court's executive power an jurisprudence. Term, an accurate turn, I'd like to say. You know, I, I think formalist is a term we can agree on, um, okay. right? Um, <laughs> um, but listen, I mean, I mean, one of the things I love about this case, and one of the reasons why I'm, I'm so glad to get to talk to you and work with you on it, is because I actually think our differences on so many of the issues surrounding this case, I think actually only underscores the significance of the fact that I think we agree here, right? Um, but I'll, yeah. Well, I have a couple of questions. So one, I mean, even, and maybe, you know, we don't have to spend a lot of time on this, yeah. but I mean, are we even sure that if these are judicial officers that they are free from appointments clause requirements? Well, I so, mean, right, so there's so, right. Yeah, so go ahead. I mean, there, there are so many layers here. So, um, right, if they're under Young, right, Young thought they were judicial employees, right? Well, but if they're officers, they still have to be subject to the appointments clause. So, um, to make a very, very, very long story short, right? We basically argued all of this in the Second Circuit um, and won on more of it than I think maybe we expected to at first, right? So the Second Circuit unanimously agreed with us that the private special prosecutors appointed under Rule 42 are inferior executive officers, meaning they are both in the executive branch, not the judicial branch, and they are officers, not employees. Um, and on the second part of that, that was over an amicus brief that the Justice Department had filed arguing that they were not officers at all, right? So we had all three judges holding that these private special prosecutors are inferior executive officers whose appointments must therefore comport with the appointments clause. What does that mean? It means Congress has to provide for the appointments. And it means that as inferior officers, they have to be subject under cases like Arthrex to meaningful supervision by a principal executive officer. Well, on that and, and on that point, so I just, you know, John Duffy from UVA Law School and I recently wrote extensively about this for Chicago Supreme Court Review. And it's interesting because we, you know, I love to get us bring as much out of a Supreme Court opinion as anybody. And the court is actually quite um, precise, I think, in Arthrex about um, supervision. And it seems to be trying to, I mean, but it tries to almost cabin it off if it can to the administrative patent judges, which John and I were not really able to find a principal distinction there, because what you see is that under the reasoning of Arthrex, cases like Morrison versus Olson really seem like they can't any longer be you know, understood. And certainly um, Morrison, I think, would be in tension with the, with the view that you're talking about here, right, which is that prosecution has to be supervised um, in a meaningful way by a principal officer and really ultimately by the president in some sense. You know, the president, obviously, all we all, everybody has to be operating under the duty to take care that the laws be faithfully executed. So we're not talking about politicizing things. We're just making sure that if executive power is being wielded, that there's meaningful supervision and you can't have private actors or temporarily appointed people like the folks at issue in your case running around wielding this expansive power. So, I, I mean, I guess I, you know, I don't, I happen to think that I know, I know this is a point of significant disagreement between us. I happen to think Morrison is rightly decided, um, including on the supervision point. I mean, I think the independent counsel was subject, maybe not to a, a degree of supervision that satisfies you and some of the other justices and some of the justices. I, I promoted you, some of the other justices, um, right? But, but, <laughs> I, I, but but I think that but I think the distinction, Jen, really underscores why this case isn't even close to Morrison, right? So, you know, here um, the attorney general never supervised the private the, the private special prosecutors spent the entire lit litigation in the district court taking the position that they weren't subject to supervision because they were not in the executive branch, right? The Justice Department, rather than supervising them, shows up in the Second Circuit and files an amicus brief. Mm -hmm. to express in the brief's own terms, the quote, distinct views of the executive branch, unquote. Well, how are you supervising the special prosecutor, but you still need to show up and file a brief, 
you know, uh, expressing the distinct views of the executive branch. So, mm-hmm. you know, I, I think whatever the line is after Arthrex for right. the supervision that's required, this ain't it. Um, can and, 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 a, yeah. Well, can you do us a favor and walk us through in this particular case, yeah. how the prosecutor was appointed and selected? Yeah. So uh, the district judge who referred the order to show cause also appointed these three private lawyers. Rita Glavin uh, is the lead private special prosecutor um, from from private practice. I mean, right? I think you know I, there. I'm sure there are reasons why Judge Kaplan chose uh, Miss Glavin. I think she's you know she's an excellent attorney, um, right? But she by rule she had no connection to the case. She couldn't have any connection to the case. And Jen, one of the things that's remarkable is there was no statute authorizing this appointment. And so if you have inferior executive officers, it, there, you know, I would think, I mean, the appointments clause says Congress may by law mm-hmm. provide for the appointment of those other officers as they think proper. <laughs> they be in Congress, right? Congress is supposed to say, we want to vest the appointment of inferior executive officers in someone other than the president. Where has Congress done that here? I mean, right, this is, there's no statute specifically authorizing the appointments. And so the only two remotely sort of ballpark things you could argue is the Rules Enabling Act of 1934, Mm -hmm. which is the source of authority for Rule 42. But Congress in 1934 was not exactly thinking about authorizing these appointments. Or under the Rules Enabling Act, Congress is in action in 2002, when Congress refused to block Mm -hmm. the entry into force of Rule 42 once it was proposed by the Supreme Court. You know, Jen, I I don't think this court's going to be especially sympathetic to the idea that Congress acts under the Appointments Clause by failing to disapprove um, a rule of criminal procedure. And so this is this is this is where we got our so the dissent below I mean, I said the the Second Circuit was unanimous that these are inferior executive officers. They dissented on the appointments clause. Um, so the majority opinion by Judge Park um, mm-hmm. sort of holds its nose and says there was adequate supervision because the attorney general has the formal statutory authority to supervise all prosecutions um, under 28 USC 516. And on the specific problem of did Congress authorize the appointment, you know, the panel tried to duck by saying we hadn't fully made that argument below. And therefore, it was only subject to plain error review. When, as Judge Menashe pointed out in his dissent, we did make that argument below, and mm-hmm. we were right. Um, so, you know, I think I think the if there's an obstacle to cert here, it's convincing the court that the plain error holding is nonsense. But fortunately, I think Judge Menashe's dissent does that for us. Like his his dissent explains, I think, in detail why this isn't a plain error case. Why, on the merits, there's no good argument. That Rule 42 satisfies the appointments clause. And so at the very least, my hope is that the court will see this as an important enough question um, to warrant to warrant its intervention. Is this like the Nordlich petition where um, the court has not ever yet weighed in on Rule 42 and its requirements uh, in the issues that you're seeking to challenge? Yeah, I mean, the closest, the, the only sort of two cases where the court has ever said anything about this are Young itself, which we talked about, Um, And in Young, you know, there was no appointments clause issue. Like no one in Young was arguing that Rule 42 under its pre-2002 version implicated the appointments clause at all. And then the next year in a case called Providence Journal, um, there was a fight over whether the special, a a special prosecutor could represent the United States in the Supreme Court specifically. Um, And the court said, no, the SG has to do that. Um, Neither of those cases, Jen, come anywhere close, right, to sort of grappling with the latent conflict between Young and its conception of judicial power, right? And every subsequent case, Morrison, Sala Law, Lucia, Arthrex, right? Mm-hmm. And their conception of executive power. And, you know, the, the current court might actually think this is an exception. And we ought to preserve this weird historical exception for contempt prosecutions. But the irony of the sort of posture of the case is, That's not what the Second Circuit held, right? The Second Circuit agreed with us that these are executive officers exercising executive power. Once you take that step, right, the only way to actually sort of uphold the appointments here is to really do some damage, I think, um, to the court's appointments clause jurisprudence. 
So normally we think of prosecutors as U.S. attorneys or the assistants who work with them. Could you talk a little bit about um, whether there's a particular standard or trigger that causes these Rule 42 special prosecutors to come into play? And then I'd also be curious as to um, any way in which they report to the AG at all. I mean, when you say there's no meaningful supervision, what does that relationship look like? Yeah, I mean, so... Um... The, my, I'll do that. Let me take the second part first because it's easier to answer. Um, so the answer is we don't know, <laughs> um, right? I mean, the, the special prosecutor's positions in this case in the district court was that they did not report to the attorney general, was that they did not need to report to the attorney general. Um, the When DOJ showed up in the Second Circuit and filed an amicus brief, it represented that there had been no contact, right? That there had been no interaction um, with regard to that brief which seems again kind of at odds with the idea that you know the special prosecutors were working for the attorney general. Um, so you know part of what we argue in the brief in the petition is that part of why it's important for Congress to authorize interbranch appointments is because Congress will then presumably create mechanisms for supervision. Um, right, those mechanisms, Jen, might not be adequate in everyone's view. Right, that's the Arthrex problem, but at least they exist. I mean, the independent counsel statute. For better or for worse, it had supervision mechanisms, right? We, we might debate whether they were sufficient supervision mechanisms, but they were in the statute. Here, all there is is Rule 42. And all Rule 42 was meant to do was to enshrine the Brennan judicial power construction in Young, which is part of why it says nothing about who prosecutes or who supervises the special prosecutors. At one point, Judge Preska, who was the district judge who, was, who presided over the trial, um, said, I have no idea if the special prosecutors are supervised by Judge Kaplan, who appointed them, right, by the attorney general, or by both. Um, and, you know, Jen, as you know, the default rule is that the person who has the power to appoint right. mm -hmm. has the power to remove, right? But by that logic, right, the special prosecutors were only subject to Judge Kaplan's supervision, and then we have an even bigger separation of powers problem. So, you know, my, my hope is not, not necessarily that everyone at this stage is going to agree that we're right, right? My hope is to persuade folks that this is at least a, a paradox that the Supreme Court ought to um, clean up. Um, and, that, and, and that sort of this awkward, the, the awkward attempt to square the circle that the Second Circuit did in this case can't really be the answer. Well, and I, what I also love about this particular petition is that normally um, connected to your point about the person who appoints having the power to remove and then supervise, you know, over the past several decades, often when the court has considered executive branch supervision, it's been it's been conceiving of supervision as coming through the removal authority. Mm -hmm. Now, since we've had the U.S. versus Arthrex decision, the court see, and this is this is really a main theme of John Duffy's in my article. The court seems to have also acknowledged and noted that there's also an importance in being able to direct as the power to supervise, right? Because if, if all you can do is fire an officer, how does the president or the AG ever instruct people to affirmatively act in the first place? And so this case provides a, a way to look at what kind of meaningful direction or review needs to happen as decisions are being made, briefs being written, the decision whether to bring the prosecution in the first place. How is all of that subject to um, the president and whom executive power is, is vested if he's the one ultimate, he or she is the one ultimately supervising? On the removal question, is there a mechanism to remove these special prosecutors like there would have been in the independent counsel context under Morrison? No, and, and indeed, so in the oral argument in the Second Circuit, there was this remarkable exchange between Rita Glavin, the lead special prosecutor, and all three of the judges on the panel, especially Judges Park and Menashe, where they kept asking her if she could be fired by the attorney general, and she kept equivocating, um, right? And and I, as as you know, as the as the defendant's lawyer, I can't point to any rule that tells me who removes the private special prosecutors, to any statute that tells me who removes the private special prosecutors, which of course is problematic in two respects. It's problematic first in that that kind of confusion by itself seems to raise a separation of powers problem. It's problematic doctrinally because under ex parte Henin and all of the subsequent Supreme Court decisions, right, the, the power to remove is supposed to inhere in the power to appoint unless 
the relevant decision maker has delegated it elsewhere. Um, and Rule 42 doesn't give anyone else the power to remove a private special prosecutor who's appointed under that rule. No statute says anything. And so how could you have a scenario where you have private special prosecutors who are in the Second Circuit's view inferior executive officers, but who can only be removed by the judge who appointed them without any supervision by the attorney general? Like that's so there somewhere along the way, this narrative falls apart. And I think there are a couple of potential points where that happens. But one way or the other, like I, just, I don't see how you can keep this boat afloat all the way through the analysis. Now, is this a recurring issue? Are there is there a circuit split on these questions? So no, I mean the the it turns out that um, most of the time when there's a contempt referral under Rule Forty Two, DOJ does agree to prosecute it. So we actually weren't able to find many other instances of um, we, we found other instances, Jen, of appointments of private special prosecutors, but most of those cases sort of fizzled for some reason, right? The um, the case never went to a conviction or there was some kind of settlement or something, right? That there was um, there was no appealable final judgment. Um, and so, you know, for sort of the Supreme Courtners, that might sound like it's a vehicle problem, right? Like, you know, well, if this only happens once in a blue moon, why should we care? Um, and I guess my response to that is, is twofold. Um, first, right, the rarity of the appealable final judgment um, is actually why this is a good vehicle, right? Here's a chance for the court to actually weigh in in a case where everyone agrees it can. But Jen, second, and this is the more important point, the Second Circuit's analysis of the appointments clause and of Arthrex is not limited to this context, right? Like under the Second Circuit's analysis, Congress does not have to expressly delegate its appointment power to satisfy the appointments clause. And you can have supervision when everyone agrees that there is no supervision in fact um, and that do, seems to be like a problem. I do find that to be quite troubling. I mean, it's, it is an interesting question when it says Congress has to establish by law officers of the United States. And it was very clear in the you know, Stanford article that I did looking at the history here that that didn't necessarily require um, mind numbing levels of specificity. Right. Sure. There could be a statutory provision that would say, oh, and the Treasury Secretary can hire as many clerks as he or appoint as many clerks as he needs to. But here we have a different issue where it's not about specificity. It's about another body, uh, at least one step removed from Congress, if not more, coming up with, 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 with the rule. And so it does seem like it, it would be an interesting thing and an important thing for the court to take a look at. What exactly does it mean to have Congress established by law? Also, are we comfortable with this idea of interbranch appointments? How far can that power extend? I know Professor Akhil Amar actually, um, in a law review article decades ago, talked about how in his understanding of the structure of the Constitution and early evidence, that it seems as though there really shouldn't be much interbranch appointment at all, because to have supervision over executive officers, there really needs to be that appointment. And the court has weighed in a little bit, but not that much. Um, in your view, for the court to give full consideration to this case, would it have to actually overrule or disagree with any of its past precedent, or is this an open field? Um, I think it would be easy enough for the court to decide this case without overruling anything. I mean, I think the, right, that there, there but, but the problem is the way, the way to do that, right, the way to leave Young intact um, is, to, is to say that this is actually really all about judicial power, not executive power, right, which is not what the Second Circuit did, um, right? The, the next thing to say is, I think there are ways to sort of preserve some parts of Young, if not all of it, um, which is to say, courts have the power to prosecute or at least to, to sort of to remedy contempts that occur in front of them, direct contempts and summary contempts, um, right? And the problem only arises when you have a criminal contempt prosecution. Mm -hmm. That's the point at which this no longer becomes an exercise of judicial power. Um, but I think the, the key to me though is, I don't think the court has to touch any of its executive power cases. This case does not implicate Morrison, right? This case does not implicate um, say the law, Arthrex, Edmund, any of that pantheon of cases, Freitag. Like, I think, you know, the question here is just how to reconcile 
young, which looks like an outlier against the backdrop of all those cases with those cases. And, you know, Jen, the justices might reconcile it differently than I would, right? You might reconcile it differently than I would. I think that the key for us is the Second Circuit's effort cannot be the right answer. Um, and so, you know, whatever folks think the right answer is, it sure seems like the kind of case the justices ought to be interested in. If anything, all the more so because I don't think it is especially partisan, right? Like, I, I mean, I, like this strikes well, me as just sort not, of a clean- right? the, the majority yeah. and the dissenting opinion are both written by Trump appointed, yeah. recently appointed ju judges on yeah. the Second Circuit. So it's that yeah. in and of itself is, I think, I think, I think quite noteworthy. Um, I'm also noticing as I look actually, or focusing a little bit more on this as I'm looking at the text of the, of the rule now, that your provision includes the interest of justice language that the other petition that um, the clinic and I am supporting, the Nordlich petition includes in the Rule 33 context. So it, it would be interesting to hear and think about the, it, whether the court has, has views on that standard. And I suppose that's not directly an issue for you because you're not necessarily challenging the way in which the decision to prosecute or to appoint or that there needed to be somebody came about it's more who can do the appointing and how's it supervised maybe but i mean let's walk through because i know we're coming near to the end of our time but if we look at rule 42 i guess the argument that it's judicial power here would be that this is really about prosecuting people who have committed criminal contempt so rule 42 says a person who commits criminal contempt may be punished for that after prosecution on notice. And then if we go down to the part of the rule that most interests you, A2, the court has to request the contempt be prosecuted by an attorney for the government, which would presumably be an executive official. Unless the interest of justice requires the appointment of another attorney. And so that's curious, like as, as you're saying, maybe somewhat vague, like when would the interest of justice require the appointment of another attorney? And then even once we get there, we have more. If the government declines the request, the court must appoint another attorney to prosecute the contempt. So we're talking about a situation where the executive branch has really declined to go after the criminal contempt. And presumably the court is then trying to preserve its own institution and its own criminal contempt order by making sure that somebody is available to defend and to go after the court's own ruling. And so the court has a vehicle to do that if the executive branch is not going to step up to the plate and help it. So if you conceived of this whole thing as just being courts protecting their own criminal contempt orders, then you might see it as an exercise of judicial power. You're saying that construct would sit in conflict with the Second Circuit ruling. It would also be just intriguing because regardless of whose criminal rights or interests we're trying to protect, normally we do think of prosecution, at least under modern practice, as being an executive function. Um, and it just raises a very curious structure where you've got the courts and the executive branch sort of mixing and matching these roles. Um, and it's all being done under this federal rule of criminal procedure, not a provision that Congress has actually itself authorized. So the people who are supposed to be creating these structures, our elected representatives, were not really, um, you know, in, involved here. And so it seems like a lot for the court to unpack and perhaps a really important issue uh, for them to weigh in on. But do you have thoughts yeah. yourself on what interest of justice here means? So, I mean, I think that part of the rule is dealing with cases where DOJ itself is conflicted out. Um, right. So so imagine a circumstance where there's a criminal contempt to which DOJ is. A, imagine if the criminal contempt was committed by a government lawyer. Um, right. I think that's a circumstance where the interest of justice to, you know, would might demand um, that someone who's not a Justice Department lawyer right, be appointed to prosecute. But this is where I mean, I think, you know, one of the sort of famous early separation of powers cases is this case called Anderson versus Dunn. Uh, which got cited all the time for other things, but it's actual holding, which Jen, I'm sure you know well, right, is um, Congress lacks the power, right, to prosecute its own contempts, right? Congress has inherent authority to punish contempt of Congress. You can lock someone up in the old Capitol jail, but if Congress wants, if Congress wants the contempt offense to be prosecuted, that's not Congress's job, right? Congress has to refer the offense to the executive. This is why contempt of Congress is now a standalone criminal statute. It's why contempt of Congress has to be prosecuted by the executive branch. 
to me, like the easiest way to understand this case is to ask whether contempt of court should be any different, um, right? If criminal contempt of Congress is something that is serious enough to be a criminal offense, bringing with it all of the powers of the government, right? And yet something that we don't let Congress enforce by itself, right? Why would criminal contempt of court as opposed to civil contempt or direct contempt be any different? And Jen, there might be an answer to that question, right? Young itself, I think, might have been Justice Brennan's attempt to answer that question. Um, I just think that the Second Circus decision here tries to have its cake and eat it too, by saying that this really is not judicial power, it's executive power, but it's permissible executive power, even though there's no statute and even though there's no supervision. That to me is why, however this cashes out at the end of the day, right? I, I am biased, but I think it's pretty certworthy. So this is clearly an interesting case, and I understand why it'd be great fun to work on it, which is one reason why um, the George Mason Scalia Law School Separation of Powers Clinic is interested in partnering with you. But you know, you're a scholar, you've got a book coming out, you teach a lot of classes. How did you first get interested in your role as a law professor in representing um, criminal defendants or other parties at the highest level of the judiciary? Yeah, you know, it's it's been sort of a scattershot thing for me. I mean, the so the first, you know, I was I was doing a lot of amicus work, um, as Jen, you have done and as you are doing with your clinic, um, right? As a law professor, um, in cases raising Fed courts questions, in cases raising separation of powers questions, and for better or for worse, I think through that work, I built relationships and partnerships with folks, so that when a couple of merits cases came along, where they thought I was uniquely situated to sort of mesh the practice experience with the academic nerd nerddom um right it worked out well so you know I've, i mean i've done i guess what three merits cases now in the supreme court right um we have a couple of petitions pending i, I think it's just really important as even as we're having broader debates about the supreme court as an institution for academics to be involved in litigation before the court as well right because i think it's a sort of it's a mutualistic relationship where our work benefits, our academic work benefits from being involved in these That's cutting right. edge practical questions. And I think that the, the legal analysis in court benefits from, you know, our sort of our academic, um, I guess, background, our chops, our priors, um, right, and helping to bring, you know, not just a sort of individual lawyer's perspective to an issue, but a broader holistic view of the issue to, you know, to the Supreme Court. Well, it certainly seems like in cases where an academic who's written a lot in a particular area can come as an outside observer who doesn't actually have a real stake in the case, but still say the academic scholarship would suggest X, like that does seem to often present an, perhaps another um, reservoir of information or analysis for the court to turn to, to be able to kind of get another perspective that often just even with length limitations, the briefs cannot necessarily um, address. And so it does sort of seem to work in certain instances. And I think you're exactly right that um, your work as a law professor um, definitely is, is enriched and you have um, a unique perspective to offer in representing the parties themselves. And so um, it's nice that you've got the time the time and the resources to be able to do that and as you say this seems to be just a really interesting case um when do you anticipate um the petition will reach the justices for review for yeah i mean so it was it was docketed on thursday the 22nd um that means that by rule doj and and Ironically, it is DOJ, not the special prosecutors, um, who has to respond. Um, so they've got 30 days, as you know. Um, I would be surprised if they waived a response in this case. I think I think they probably will feel like they have to respond. Um, but also that that will probably come with several extensions. So if I had to bet, um, I would expect a DOJ response sometime after Thanksgiving, um, maybe early December, and then hopefully we'd be able to get a reply in so that the petition could be considered at one of the justices first conferences next year mm -hmm. um, in time in time for the case to be heard you know this ter this coming term so in time for maybe like an april argument if we actually do somehow get a grant that's that's my best prediction for the timing but as i mean as you know right these things can sometimes get a little haywire Right. Well, as you, you know, with the, in the Nordlich petition, the one dealing with the new trial right that the clinics uh, filed amicus uh, support in, 
the government definitely chose to file a response. And as you're mentioning with extensions, actually requested three extensions. Right. So that in and of right. itself suggested to me that maybe it was, you know, it was certainly something they felt weighty enough to, uh, to respond to. Um, and then the response, however, was mostly focused on the facts of the case as opposed to really taking on the circuit split. And I think that to me seems more like a strategic tactic, right? Mm -hmm. And trying to suggest that a criminal case, a case that involves a lot of facts, um, is going to be challenging for the court to take a look at or just more cumbersome than makes sense. You wouldn't address the split. You would try to suggest you talk about the facts. But in some of these criminal cases, at least with the new trial, right, it's always going to be fact dependent, right? It's about weighing evidence. In your case, there's a number of different um, issues, perhaps, that have to be looked at. So just the fact that there are, you know, facts in dispute or, or that could be seen a couple of different ways doesn't really speak to the certworthiness, I don't think, of any of these um, cases. Um, but the fact that the government would weigh in and respond is certainly a key indicator that it's something that merits consideration, perhaps merits the court's review. And so we'll see what they do in these cases. Do you think that the presence of Justice Jackson and just a slightly different composition of the court will, um, in her background as a public defender, might impact the court's proclivity to take a greater share of criminal cases than perhaps it has in the past? Or do you think the balance will remain the same? Um, that's a good question. I, I don't know. I mean, the reality is that, you know, Justice Jackson's still only a third vote for cert, if you assume it's the liberals who are pushing for cert. Um, and so I think the question is, you know, is she going to be able to build relationships across the aisle with maybe someone like a Justice Gorsuch, right, who has, I think, shown interest in those kinds of connections in criminal cases, especially. Um, you know, what I, I think Nordlicht is probably a better bellwether for that than Donziger, because Nordlicht really is, I think, a classic criminal procedure type of issue. Um, whereas Donziger, even though it's a criminal case, right, the fact that it's a criminal case, I think, is almost a sideshow compared to the sort of the separation of powers and appointments clause issues, right, that the case presents. So, you know, in that respect, I think we'll have to see. Um, I don't doubt that Justice Jackson will have an, a, a particular interest in criminal cases. I think the question is whether anyone's going to come with her. <laughs> um, and that I think that's just going to be, you know, something we have to watch for. Well, we'll see. It could be shaping up to be another blockbuster term this year with the the Harvard, the UNC cases up, some voting rights, and hopefully these criminal matters before the court. So, Steve, thank you so much for your time. Hopefully, we'll be talking about these cases uh, months down the line, and great to be with you here this afternoon. Likewise. Thanks for having me. Okay. Talk to you soon.